Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. My name is Benny Y, and I'm from Patterson uh, Food Group. I'm here to talk about a retail use case, e-com driver auto scheduling. So first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a manager of Alex Development, and in Alex Development, groups in Patterson Food Group specialize in creating data pipelines, machine learning, algorithms, and optimization solutions for the rest of the organization. I have a master's degree in operations research, and I'm very enthusiastic about machine learning and optimization. I also love meeting new people. So if you haven't had a chance to talk to me, come say hi. If you're online, add me on LinkedIn, and we'll talk about some interesting problems together. In this presentation, I'll be talking first about Patterson Food Group, PFG for short. It is Canada's largest Western-based provider of food and health products. And I'll be talking a little bit about its history as well. Then I'll be talking about how we got started with D-Wave. Then I'll talk about the problem itself, what the problem is, the scope, the technologies that we used, how we set up the problem, as well as the results and outputs. Lastly, I'll be very excited to talk about what's next in our journey in using quantum computing to solve business problems. The history of Patterson Food Group actually started in 1915 under a different name, Overweighty Foods. Now, you might think to yourself, Overweighty Foods? That's a rather strange name for a grocery chain. Well, it wasn't strange for those patrons of that first store that started in British Columbia, Canada, because that store sold 18 ounces of tea for the price of 16, and hence, Overweight Tea. Let's fast forward 100 years. The year is 2015. We have 145 retail stores all across uh, many Western Canada provinces. We have 22,000 team members, three banners, and over a dozen collective bargaining agreements, which makes scheduling rather difficult. In 2015, we were better known under our main banner, Save on Foods. And I really want to emphasize that 2015 was a key year because that's when the business really realized that they had to invest in a digital transformation. At the scale and rate that we were growing, our legacy technology was not going to keep up with our growth. A few years later, our data and analytics department uh, was created, and we started hiring data scientists, data engineers, machine learning engineers, and operation data engineers to really leverage the data that we had. So now let's talk about this year, 2023. Our owners have created Patterson Food Group and merged many banners together. We now have over 300 retail stores across Western Canada and the United States. We have over 30,000 team members, 13 banners, and we've even started looking into automation for supply chain. Now, as a fun fact, uh, we were actually the first grocer in Western Canada to actually do online shopping. And with this project that I'm, gonna, I'm about to tell you, we will have another first under our belt. We'll be, we will be the first grocery chain to actually use quantum computing for, to serve our business needs. So in 2020, uh, COVID was on everybody's mind. We really wanted to connect with D-Wave to understand how we can help the retail stores. And in particular, we wanted the team members to focus less on things that could be automated and instead focus on what matters the most, giving customers the attention they need during a very stressful period. So by 2020, of Jul July of 2020, we actually created a proof of concept for an auto-scheduling solution for a non-union store. It was very successful, and our plan was to continue to test out different stores and scale it out and roll it out to the rest of the banners. However, COVID provided another challenge and opportunity. Ecom was growing. We had a dramatic increase in the number of ecom orders, and our business really wanted to focus there first. So we put this project on hold, and we first wanted to solve the ecom auto scheduling problem. So what is the problem? I'll give you some context. So customers right now can go online and purchase groceries and have it delivered to their doorsteps. 
They can choose from one of 100 plus uh, stores that have e-com deliver capabilities. They would enter their address, enter a time window, and have it del delivered as early as the next day. So what actually happens behind the scenes is that team members pack their groceries, um, they put it in the waiting area. And then e-com drivers would then look at their schedules, find out which days they worked and what time, which store they were assigned to, and arrive at the store with a van at that store. So once they're at the store, they would take up the groceries and bring it to the customer's doorsteps. But in order for that to happen, of course, we need the schedules. There's a team of three to four e-com driver schedulers that create uh, schedules for all 500 plus drivers all across the provinces. And that's a lot of manual effort. So the motivation here is can we actually automate the scheduling process while taking in all the agreements into consideration, seniority, and to make sure that we don't negatively impact turnover. So seniority and preferences have to be taken into account as well. So our team realized we really needed to understand the scheduling process. We connected with the schedulers starting at the very top left, and we spent multiple days trying to understand uh, what was important to them and what issues that they had. We ended up with three to four long pages of notes, and then we spent a lot of time actually having whiteboarding sessions within the team to distill them down to key points. And the rest is very similar to the previous presentation where, where Alex talked about creating mathematical equations based on the needs, and it really helped that within our team we had PhD, uh, uh, PhD uh, employees that actually were in physics and operations research. Once we created the uh, algorithm, uh, the equations, we then looked at the data sources that we actually required. We pulled the data sources and put it on our data lake, transformed it into the various layers into a model-ready stage. Once we had both of these things, we would then write our own Python code. To write the optimization code, uh, occasionally connecting with D-Wave to better understand how to leverage D-Wave's latest features. We would then do code debugging and parameter tuning, and once we were happy with it, we would connect with the schedulers and show them our results. They would give us feedback, we would iterate on uh, what they thought was important to tweak, do some more parameter tuning, then we moved on to testing, then we did some live testing, and eventually we went into implementation. And I'm happy to announce that as of October of last year, we went live into, pr into production, and the schedules are being created every single week and are being used by the schedulers. Thank you. So I mentioned distilling down the, uh, the many notes into key components, and here they are. I'm not gonna go through each and every one of them, but their equation counterpart are on the right. Some of the ones that are important to talk about is the demand. So the demand means that the scheduler understands that at a particular time, at a particular store, there needs to be drivers there to pick up the orders for the customers. This is very important to the business, obviously. Uh, another important key feature is making sure that the drivers are happy. So we wanna make sure that uh, they're uh, requested or they're suggested or their favorite store is met uh, and we also want to make sure that we give them consistent schedules, especially for those that are the most senior. Of course, at Patterson Food Group, we want to make sure all our employees are happy, but sometimes an optimal solution that makes everybody happy doesn't exist, and therefore we prioritize our most senior team members first. Next, I'm going to be talking about the technology. At the very bottom are some of the things that we use throughout our development and uh, in production. We have two main data pipelines. We have data engineering and data science. Data engineering pulls the sources of data into the data lake and we transform it into a model uh, uh, ready stage. In the data science pipeline, we actually pull this data and we construct the CQM problem. We send the problem over to the D-Wave uh, quantum annealer. Once solved, it comes back to us and then we uh, format it into a, a schedule-ready format that the schedulers know and love. And throughout both pipelines, we actually end up using Kedro, which is a Python framework that's really good to ensure our code is reproducible and modular, especially during implementation. 
One last thing I want to point out is that in MLflow, uh, we use MLflow usually for machine learning, and we've done that for in the past, but we actually use MLflow to log our optimization results. Whenever a constraint for a certain schedule uh, is not met, it lets us know, which also really helps us for debugging purposes as well as maintaining it. We have a team of operation data engineers to maintain the model uh, once it's in production. So enough about what we did, let's talk about the results. So this is actually a schedule for Victoria in British Columbia, and we're just talking about the essentials. So I'm gonna only add a few constraints in here and see what the results are, and I'm going to show you the impact of adding additional constraints, and eventually we'll have the full-blown schedule. So there's a lot of things going on here, and I'll break it down piece by piece. The first is each week, uh, each schedule is based on a week. So it starts on a Sunday and ends on a Saturday. So the first seven columns are those seven days. Each row represents a team member with their names not shown, and it's uh, ordered in descending seniority order. So the first row represents the most senior member in that Victoria area, second is the most, second most senior, and so on and so forth, and it's also represented in this normalized seniority rating here. Each team member has a maximum and a minimum number of shifts that they enter themselves uh, when they join the team. The maximum number uh, that they can work in a week is five. Of course, they can choose a number less than that. And two is always the default unless for some reason they can't even work up to two, therefore it will be lower. And lastly, this column here, schedule, is actually uh, based on the solution how many shifts they were actually scheduled for that week and it's good for us to look at it as we add in the additional constraints. Each of these blocks represents a shift that is represented by two things. The first is the time of the shift, and the second is the store that they're assigned to. And to make it a little bit easier to read, it's color-coded based on those two things. So for example, orange is always starting at 6 a.m. for store 2227. Lastly, there are certain shifts that say RTO, that is a requested time off. These are special things such as team members knowing that they have a birthday party to go to or they just can't work that day and they say, for this week, I can't work that day. This is on top of their regular availabilities that's not shown here. So right off the bat, uh, you can notice that it's kind of a little bit all over the place. For even a single person, they have different colored shifts AKA they're uh, assigned to different stores or starting at different times. And that's just because we're only adding in the constraints to make it a schedule. Right now, the only constraints added in is it meets the, de the demand for the business. There is a 10 hour gap between shifts for a single individual. The max and min is, uh, is respected. Their availability is respected and RTOs are also respected. So it is a schedule, but I think we can do better. Let's add on two more constraints. So we've add on shift bunching, which means that I wanna encourage the schedules to be bunched up close together. Another way to think about this is the number of time that they have off is also grouped together as well, and is biased towards the most senior people. The next one is based on cross week limit, which actually in this case doesn't really affect it. Basically what it says is between this week and the last week, they can't work more than six days in a row together. It's looking a little bit better but there's two jarring issues. First is the coloring, and the second, uh, I see that the most senior people are not necessarily getting the maximum number of shifts. In this case, the most senior person is only getting two out of the four shifts. So let's add a constraint to change that. So in this case, we've added shift, uh, sh shift seniority prioritization. It looks a lot better now, and if Anyone who was curious, in this case, this person actually can't work on the Wednesday based on their availability, and that's why it looks that way. Uh, so everything that we talked about, including bunching, is in right now, and the most senior people are most likely to get their maximum shift. These are soft constraints. They don't necessarily need to be met if, uh, if it's not possible to, but everybody that's not senior doesn't necessarily have the maximum number of shifts. But it's still a little bit all over the place based on the coloring. So let's add in one more constraint. Now we've taken a look at their five-week history. 
every uh, team member, we looked at what was their most scheduled store and their most scheduled time. And based on that, we've uh, implemented this once again based on seniority, and it looks a lot better. Without this, it would be a little bit hectic because people would be going to different stores that would have to get used to the parking, they would have to get used to the people working there, and they would have to get used to the store layout. And this makes them a lot happier as well. So I'm gonna quickly show you two more examples. This one is for Calgary North, the full-blown solution. Uh, this is a really good example where our shift requirements actually exceeds the number of people that can actually work the shifts. So as you can see, the solution provided actually says everybody's working the maximum number of shifts, and we actually, not shown here, actually have another uh, aggregate table that shows them uh, how many shifts are un unmet. In this case, all the requirements that we talked about before is still met. This is a really good example of even when there's not enough people working there, the schedule adheres to those constraints. This last example is Grandview, by far our largest schedule. Um, in fact, this actually, there's actually more to this. Usually we have around 45 to 60 team members that are scheduled for this. It's very large, and yet again, the constraints are still being met. So next I'm gonna talk about success criteria. On top of making sure that the schedulers that we're working with are happy, uh, we talk about two success criteria. The first is we work with them to create a quantifiable list of metrics. The second is we wanna make sure uh, we understand how, many, how much manual effort is actually saved every week. And the target is 80 hours because that's how long it currently takes. So I'm not gonna go through each and every one of this, but I'm gonna highlight some of the important ones. So demand, really important for business. We put a really high threshold. 95% of the demand must be met. Another one is we want to not negatively impact turnover, so job and shift preferences are there as well. And there's a certain threshold for them. Uh, emphasis on the most senior team members. And for all 42 work groups, that's how many schedules that we create every week to to capture schedules for all 100 plus stores are meeting this. Next, we found out uh, after it went live, two, uh, two to three months afterwards, we did a test, and based on the feedback that we got, we're actually saving 65 out of the 80 hours that are spent every single week. So the reason for the remaining 15 hours are twofold. The first is our uh, workforce uh, workforce management system, the system, the platform that they actually use to put in the schedules. Uh, for a lack of a better term, it's very legacy. Uh, it's still very slow, and it doesn't have the ability to put in schedules indirectly. We're looking for a replacement, and when that comes in, we're going to save even more of the 80 hours. The second is we wanna give the schedulers agency. So we give them the schedules a little bit ahead of time, and between the time that they get it and when they post it, there might be people leaving or joining the team or calling in sick, and they still have to spend a little bit of time adjusting for that. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about lessons learned and what's next. We learned the importance of logging using MLflow for optimization, really good for maintenance and debugging, and meet model seniority. We learned how to do that, and uh, it really helped with what's next, which is, going back to the retail labor scheduling problem. So that problem is very large. Uh, the shifts are changing in, in times and lengths. On top of that, for a single shift, there might be different uh, departments that a team member might be working. But I'm really confident that my team, with the ex experience under the belt and with the use of quantum annealing, they're able to so solve this problem. I'm really looking forward to the results. Thank you so much.